This evening we're going to explore three works, and therefore we may very likely need three follow-up talks for each one of the subjects. Not one talk with three, but in any case, I am interested in making this comparison because I'd like to make a couple of points, and in doing it, I think I'm going to lead you to a curious conclusion, and the conclusion I think is going to be summarized in terms of the problem of fairness. That's where we're going, problem of fairness. So let me jump into it. First, I'd like to take up the Diamond Sutra. But before I do that, I have just one s small question I'm sure you all have very good answers to. Nothing and something. Now, on any level that you want to take this, on what basis do you say something or nothing? That's going to be the fundamental issue. So then, would you be willing to go along with the following reasoning? If there's nothing, it's likely you're not going to be able to have a perception of it. Is that safe to say? Good. Good. Is it equally likely that we can be comfortable in coming to a tentative conclusion? That if there is something, and you make a claim that there is something, you should have some perception or experience of it. No. Here's the whole problem for the evening. There are a set of things for which there is no specific perception. And therefore, there's no specific experience of it. Now, I'm using the word perception in the widest sense. Any way of knowing. So it's really cognition. Any cognitive experience. So experience is going to include the entire intellectual facility. So all the ways in which we apprehend anything. Good. Now look here. Strictly speaking, then, can we say that right now, if you have a perception of something, it should very likely, ah, there's a piece of truck, that if you have a perception of something, you should be able to make some statement about the thing you perceived. Now, if you do that, would you agree in some way you have to distinguish it from something else or all else. Mm -hmm. Now look here. Self, soul, mind. Can you have a perception of it? Can you have a unique experience of it and nothing else? That's where we're on. So now that we've just explored that for a moment, I'd like to now quote a few lines from the Diamond Sutra. Now I'm taking this from Edward Conzi's translation. And the Diamond Sutra is part of the Prajnaparamita Sutra, which includes a, a whole tradition of some six or 700 years. That is to say, there's no specific author for this. Now at 14c, in the translation that I'm using, which is the Buddhist wisdom books, it's a very fine translation. At 14c, he makes this comment. Take a look at it now. Take a look at it. In them, however, no perception of a self will take place or of a being, a soul, or a person. That is indeed no perception. And why? Because the Buddhas, the Lords, have left all perception behind. 
Where they are, there's no perception. However they're functioning, they're functioning beyond the realm of perception. If so, if they are beyond all perception, then would you agree whether or not you can perceive these things or not, in one, si one sense, we can ignore it because they're beyond all perception. Now look at the next one. Though. Now This follows it. With my superhuman knowledge, I recall that in the past I've had 500 births or reincarnations. I led the life of a sage devoted to patience. Then also, I have had no perception of a self, a being, a soul, or a person. There is nothing there to perceive. Therefore, they come up with this very fine insight that since there is nothing like this, we can say the truth of the nature of reality is emptiness. That means not that there is a state of nothingness, but it's empty of self, soul, mind, ego. Therefore, if you get a clear perception of the highest level, you'll find that there's the idea of self, soul is a metaphor, something that we use to collect many ideas together. But in essence, there's nothing there specifically to experience. Now here he leaves all perception behind, and for these 500 births, of course, and reincarnations, he says he's had no perception of it. So he's taking both sides. Here is beyond, and here there is none. Now this is repeated throughout the Diamond Sutra in a variety of ways. And uh, in the famous Platform Sutra, To be able to perceive the truth of that immediately is enlightenment. That's what enlightenment is. So to be able then to just emptiness, that is the experience of Satori. That's enlightenment. Now, it's rather interesting. It all rests upon this one word. Perception. All the rest by noise. So beyond it, or there's no possible way in which you can encounter anything that remotely resembles a unique thing that goes by any of those names. That's the entire tradition. I mean, that's the heart of Buddhism in the Mahayana sense in the northern school. To grasp that immediately without any intervening thoughts, to be able to just be there and recognize the truth of it, that's enlightenment. Now, I'm going to go further now. Um, I'd like to bring up another tar, another issue. A curious one, therefore I need my marker. I'd like to know about this curious word. It comes up again and again. Uh, it comes up again. It comes up again. Look, look there. It comes up again. <laughs> what I'd like to know is, uh, what is a negation? What is a no? What is a negation? Huh? What's a negation? I need to know that because everything that follows hinges upon the word perception and the word no. Huh. Let me give an example. I know something that exists in some way, but it never moves. Okay. Motion.
Does motion move? Or do things in motion move? Does motion move? Or do things in motion move? The latter. Oh, oh, then motion doesn't move. Oh, I see, there's no motion in motion. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Gosh, there's no motion in motion. Uh, I really know about that, there's no motion. Hey, but wait a minute, would you go further and uh, risk another judgment? There's no motion in motion. Could you not say, however, that anything in motion in some way derives its source of motion from motion? Yeah. So wait a minute. Is it possible then that in a very interesting way a certain set of negations that you deny something having, it can also said to be the source of what it is that's denied. Let's take the trivial sense of it. Um, this, no matter how much you argue, this is not reincarnation. Uh, sir, would you concur with that judgment? Would you like to examine it yourself, or is it sufficient to say, I can go along with that judgment, <laughs> that this is not reincarnation? Good, good. But even though it is not reincarnation, you're not going to say this is the source of reincarnation, are you? So then there are some things that you can deny negative. The particular characteristic but yet that particular characteristic is denied from the thing that is denied or negated. Is that right? Well, then there are two classes of negative things. Would that follow from our reasoning? Good, good, good. Now you may later worry about whether or not you gave me too much when you agreed to this. Well, all right. What? What? I don't see it. Did you what don't you see? That there's two classes of negation. Didn't you agree that this is not, this is not reincarnation? Yes. But yet it's not the source of neg of reincarnation. No. Therefore, that's one use of the word no and not, is it not? Yes. But wait a minute. Didn't we say that motion is not in motion? Right. But only things are. Mm -hmm. Well, then that's a negation. Motion is not moving. And we can even go further and say it's also not in rest. Agree? But motion is the source of yes. motion. I see, I see, I see. Then you do understand there are two uses of the word negation and no. Since you just agreed to two different kinds of knowing and negation. Yeah, I know Thank that you. I did that, but I'm not, still not clear. <laughs> You're not sure whether it's as, you know, one of these sly of hand tricks. Of course. <laughs> Of course, of course, you're quite right. Now look here. Now look here. Now we're going to go a little bit more, see? Motion itself does not move, but rather the move thing moves. Yet the negation is applied to motion, for it doesn't move. Great. Everything to what we just said. And another one, look here. Each physical attribute is itself free from the relevant characteristic. For itself, being simple, either exists or does not exist, whereas what, uh, what, what, ha, <laughs> what experiences the experience through it is the composite body. That is to say, this is in motion in a composite body, it moves, right? It moves, it's in a composite body, it moves. It experiences through the experience. It experiences. It, we experience the experience. Don't we? Right. We experience the experience. By God, we're pretty clever. Right? So each physical attribute is itself free from the relevant characteristic. For itself being simple, it either exists or does not exist. Now, I like this quote, which is why I made a page of this quote that I handed out tonight. 
So let me see if I can now draw a conclusion. Now we can go back to the conclusion. Here's the conclusion now. So these negatives, or these negations, are the causes of the corresponding assertions. Now let's see what that means, okay? Let me take it up for a moment. Let's just take a quick view of uh, Plato's dialectic. Uh, for anything that you explore rationally, you can make 24 assertions. Right. 12 of them are going to be positive, and 12 are going to be negative. Of the 12, you have four categories. that are plus and four characters that are negative. For each category, you can say three things. You can assert three things, that it is true, that it is false, that is both true and false. Therefore, you have three times four, which should be 12 positive assertions, and three times four is 12, 12 negative assertions. Now you should be able to break those up into a systematic model, which is for the subject that you are speaking about, you can talk about the thing itself. That is to say, if you want, we'll talk about you. Or we'll talk about motion. Or we'll talk about likeness. Or we'll talk about the one. It doesn't matter. It follows that. Then you can say 12 positive things about you. <coughs> All right, there. Now, what are they? You can say three classes of statements about yourself. What is true about you? What is false about you? What is, can be said to be both true and false? Now, you can also say, can you not? the way you are in respect to other people. Uh, cats and beer cans. That is say, you can say things about yourself that are true, false, and both true and false. And you can also make assertions about others and the influence you have on others. You can also make three statements about that that are both true, false, and true and false. And you can, of course, make statements about the effect these things, right, these things have upon themselves, the interrelationship between these things, independent of you. And that's another three. And you can then talk about how these same kinds of things that we just described are related back to you. So these are the four categories. You can talk about you, you can talk about the one, you can talk about knowledge, you can talk about any subject, and you can make, therefore, three, six, nine, twelve positive assertions, and you can also say what it is not. Suppose you are not. What would follow if you are not? All right, then you can say three things about them. All right, if you are not, what effect would that have on everything else? What, could, what effect would that have among themselves? And what effect would all of those things have back on yourself if you do not exist? So those are basically the 12. Now, oh. Okay. Uh, that was on any subject? It doesn't have a any, any, uh, any subject whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. You can do it with likeness, you can do it with soul, you can do it with motion. Any idea or thing. Now, in these 12, just to talk about Plato's Parmenides for a moment, um, there are nine hypotheses. Now notice it doesn't fit. Four and four is eight or nine? Eight, eight yeah, yeah, we got nine categories. Well, okay, Parmenides in the second hypotheses, 
talks about the way it is in respect to itself. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. These are the four sets of positive assertions, just as we said a moment ago. These are the negative. And this is whether or not you can talk about the subject itself, in itself, by itself. Because whatever you're talking about, you have to define that first. So therefore, there are nine categories, or what they're called hypotheses. Now, they are ordered in a very interesting way. They're over ordered in two ways. One, structurally, of course. All right, you can put two, three, four, five. Those are the positive assertions about the nature of reality. And six, seven, eight, nine. And you will find that the things that are asserted of the second hypothesis are denied in the sixth. Those that are asserted of the third are denied of the seventh, and so on. Now, uh, therefore, there are also interrelationships between these, which are very interesting to work out, but this is basically the model upon which all of this theoretical thought works. Now we can also arrange it, not in this geometrical pa fashion as a cube, but we can also arrange it as a hierarchy. Now this is a hierarchical model. The highest concept is the one itself, the one. That's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is intelligence. The third, soul. The fourth, soul and matter, or body, living beings, soul and matter. Fifth one, matter alone. So, one, two, three, four, five. You see, what's quite interesting is going to be this. So these negations are the causes of the corresponding assertions. OK, what the heck does that mean? That means if we can line up all the things when Plato talks about uh, the nature of the one, if we can list, we can make a list of all that he says about the one, there's a whole bunch of negatives. There's a whole bunch of negatives. And we'll go through them. A right? whole bunch of negatives. But wait a minute, this is saying, so these negations are the causes of the corresponding assertions. Therefore, if the first hypothesis is denying a whole set of ideas, they become the assertions for the second hypothesis. That's the way he builds it, you see. Therefore, in the same way, the first can be said to be the cause of the second, or they're derived from the second. This is the way it's structured, too, logically. Right? Therefore, everything, then, which is negated of the one, if it's derived from it, everything then proceeds from the one, in the same way that we talked about a moment ago. So, look here. Now, these are the categories that are denied. Now, there's something very curious about this. We're, we can play with them. You can get into the spirit of it, and we can easily do it, and you can all join in and see how much fun it is to do it. But the thing I want to deal with in a short while is whether or not there's some significance to the order of these. Is there any significance? Why does he take this first? Why this last, etc. So that's what we want to talk about later. But let's just talk about this now. Right. Let's see how he does it. All right now we're looking only at the first hypothesis, and you can see if you just follow the first 
argument, you can see how easy it is to apply the whole thing. It takes some technical skill at some points of the logic, but ordinarily everybody can do it, get into it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, do they have any more chalk here? No, no chalk. Okay. See, it starts with if. If the one, if the one is. Now that is, in this case, does not assume existence. That's a big point in Greek thought, that you can talk about the use of the word is without attributing existence. Like you can say, uh, there is emptiness. Well, that doesn't mean you're going to look around for it. Right? Not going to look around. Oh, where? I didn't see it. Right? <laughs> So, if there is a one, and if you mean by one a pure one, would you agree one thing we have to say? It is not and cannot be considered to be a many. For if it were a many, it wouldn't be one. It would be a bunch of ones. Agree? Obvious. See how easy it is? So, if, if. If a one, if, if the one, then clearly it's not a many. It is not a many. Now, everything follows from that. If a one, not a many. By the way, if it's not a many, then could it be a whole? No. Because a whole is a sum, a sum of parts. And if a sum, a many, therefore it can't be a whole. Good. Could it be a part? For a part assumes a part. whole of which other parts and a whole of which it must be a member. Right, so it can't be that either. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now look here. If it can't be a many, it can't be a whole, it can't be a part. Hmm. Now we can play and say, look here. Is it possible, though, that it has a beginning, middle, and end? No. Well, if it did have a beginning, a middle, and an end, there would be its respective parts, would it not? And we agreed, no parts. Therefore, it can't have a beginning, middle, end. If it can't have a beginning, middle, or end, would you agree it's not going to be a shape or a figure? For any kind of shape, no matter what kind you draw or you encounter, is made up of straight lines and, and circles, agree? With various diameters springing off from it, agree? But would you agree you can't have a straight line because straight lines are getting middle and ends and it can't be composed of circles for circles have a center, they have a circumference and they have radii and those are its respective parts therefore it can't be made up of parts of itself as no parts. Oh, there that goes then. All right, all right, all right, all right. Huh. Well, look here. You do it now. Can it be in something? If you're only talking about a pure one, can it be in something? Because? Because if it's in something, it's part of it. Yeah, it didn't have to be something there to be in. Right, oh, right, 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 right. So it can't be in something. Can it be in itself? Well, if it's in itself, then a part of it must be, right? A part of it must contain it, and a part must be contained. They would be its respective parts, and therefore, at least a two, right? That's out. Oh, good, good. Hey, can it be in motion? No. For if it were in motion, pardon me? There would exist motion in which it's in, right? And would there have to be a space in which it moves? And places in which it could pass through? Ah, none of that is allowed if a pure one. Agree? Ah, ha, ha. That's out. Rest, rest, rest. Can it be at rest? If so, there's got to be a place for it to... Right, right. Uh-uh. Oh, hey, look here. If there is a one, if there is one, can it be the same as something? Because they'd have to be 
something by which you could compare it and say that it is. <laughs> no way. We're only talking about a one. Ah. Could it be other than something? Why? There's something else. See how easy you guys are just natural Platonists, right? <laughs> hey, can it be like something? No. Why not? There's something else. There's something else it would have to be like. <laughs> that have to be something similar between the same two things, right? That's out. But it can be unlike everything else, can it not? Why not? There'd have to be another one to compare it with, and you have to find something about it which it doesn't show. Oh, wow, that's out. Okay, okay. Hey, could you say it's equal to anything? It presupposes likeness and equal <laughs> equal measures or in some but it can be unequal, can't it? That presupposes unlikeness. That presupposes that's all right, all right, all right. <laughs> hey, can it be in time? No. For if it were in time. Yeah, beginning, middle, and end business, and have to be in it, and then a part of it would be getting older, and another part would be getting younger in respect to it, relatively speaking, right? So it, <laughs> it is not going to be older or younger, right, uh, than itself or anything else. By the way, then can it participate in time? No, no participate. Hey, if it doesn't participate in time, would you not agree anything that exists participates in time. It comes into existence and it passes out of existence, doesn't it? I mean this, if this is something that exists, it came into being in some time, somehow, and then it's going off very fast with the way I'm working on it, right? right? So then would you agree then, it doesn't participate in existence? Here's another reason, let's try another reason, have some fun with this one, all right? Let's put this one in together with time. Present, past, right? Past, present, future. Now, by the way, which way does time move? Does it, does it come from the future into the present and the past, or does it go the other way? Take a look. It goes either way. Or do I get confused? <laughs> Can it come either way? Can the future come? The, well, okay, whatever way. I forgot I forget about it. Okay, okay. Look here. Here is something. See, it's in the past. There it goes. All right. Can we not say if something is in time then? It comes into existence, into our present, and part of it is yet to come, or part of it has yet to come, and therefore that must have respective parts of it. Because at some time, does this come into existence all at once, or does it come in, is it possible like anything in the process of growth, maturation, and development, does it come into being through stages? If through stages, then, respectively parts of it. Well, what are we going to do then? Negate that. Negate that, right. Negate that. Right, right, right. Look here. Can you, have a, can you have a perception of it? Could you have a perception of it? That would require its existence, Well, it'd have to exist, and then it would have to, yeah, and then, what else? What, what? You'd have to exist, too. You can't have a perception without a perceiver and something perceived. Uh-oh, three. Okay, that's out. All right, all right. No perception of it, right? No. By the way, can you describe it? You mean, where are you going to describe it? Yeah, someone has to be a describer. It has to have a likeness. You have to have a likeness to describe it. Did we knock out likeness? Yes. Uh-oh, no description of it, right? But can you have a knowledge of it? Well, can't perceive it. Can't perceive it? Come on. No, because then it would be an object of knowledge. There'd That'd be, be an knower. object of knowledge. There'd be a knower, good, There'd and a process a knowing. of knowing. Mm -hmm. Ha ha. Three. Ha. Ah. Ah, could you have an opinion about it? Ah, it's out. Okay. Therefore, his conclusion is no name can be given for it. See, strictly speaking, you called it one just to start out, but you can't name it. And there's no perception of it. Now, wait a minute. Is there something similar then between what we were doing with the Diamond Sutra and what we're now doing? Yeah, no being, no soul. 
no being, no soul, no, soul, no mind, no person. What's the difference between reaching the conclusion this way and the other way? Because we're talking about what the one is not, rather than negating. No, the we're not ideas. saying what the. Well, are we, that's another. That's a difference. Oh. That's yet a difference. We can talk about what the one is not. We're just saying at this point, describing the nature of the one, aren't we? But through negation, right? Yeah, but this is, would you say this is the one since it's not all the other things it's not? No. And not me either. <laughs> right, right, I wouldn't either. So look then, let's hold on to that and do this one, all right? Now look here. Uh, so I have a question. Okay. If we're knocking at the no knowledge of the one and we're going through the step using negations to figure out the nature of the one, isn't that knowledge of the one in itself? I mean, well, good, good, good. What knowledge would you have? Well, you have knowledge of what's not. Yeah. Um, could you tell us the knowledge you have? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see, it's part of the problem of the elephant, right? The old problem of the elephant, someone's blind and tries to describe an elephant. Right. Yeah, right. I'll tell you what it's not. Good. When you say everything that it's not, then you know what an elephant is, don't you? It's not a snake. It's not a gorilla. It's not my Uncle Louie. Oh! Oh, now I know what an elephant is. Right? Since I know everything that it is not, does that leave me with the knowledge of what it is? No, no. All right. Now, I want to see if I can push this a few more steps now, all right? Now, why would anybody do this? What is the object of this kind of reflection? What's the goal? Now, what's the goal of it? It's all illogical. See, uh, there are many scholars who have argued that this whole Parmenides it's just a logical exercise that has no value beyond being a logical exercise, and that's all it is. Now, you see, Europe didn't get a copy of Plato's Parmenides and Proclus's commentary, which is where we're going, until quite late. So we're really only talking about several hundred years of, of uh, scholarship and reflection on these works as far as Europeans are concerned. So though we talk about it as ancient literature, for us it's quite new. Well, most, of, most of the Platonic tradition has come into, a good part of it has come into uh, general availability within the last 200 years. We have had Shakespeare longer than we've had most of the Platonic tradition. So just to keep that in mind. Now, what do these people say is the value of going through this? Do they say it's a logical exercise? Well, one of the great commentaries on Plato's Parmenides is a great work, which I always recommend, which has been recently translated by Mar Morrow and Dillon, called Proclus's Commentary on Plato's Parmenides. I just pulled out a couple of quotes here because he deals with this issue. Let's deal with it. Here it is. All right, on page 425, how are we to make this one and the flower of the soul shine forth unless we activate our intellect? In order that we may consort with it alone and perform a dance around it, leaving behind all intellections of the soul, which are directed to secondary things, that's why we study it. Why? Why do we do it? Because it activates the intellect. You see, we're engaged in exercising the intellect and discover its limitations. Hey, look at it. We're activating the intellect to see Right? We activate our intellect by going through this. And this is a process of training the mind, it's mind training, to silence. 
to silence the intellect. You silence the intellect by allowing it to develop to its maximum potential. You do, that's what you're doing. So that you prepare, therefore, yourself for vision. How are we to make this one and the flower of the soul shine forth unless we activate our intellect, says Proclus. In order that we may consort with it alone and perform a dance around it, leaving behind all intellections of the soul, which are really directed to secondary things, that's why we study the one. That's why we study Plato's Parmenides. Now, look here. Let me see if we can have a little more fun. All right. Let us say for the moment that we can take a look at the ancient world in a, in a different way. All right. Let's say we take the whole vision of the Greek, or let's call them Hellenics because that's what they call themselves. All right. The Latins, Romans called the, the Hellenics Greekies, Gracias, right? So we'll call them Hellenics, okay? Give them back their name. If we could get a vision of all of the gods, all of the gods, the way they understood all of their gods and all the divine. If we could then describe them all, get them all in a bag. Let's get them all now. Get them all in a bag. Got them. All the gods? Yep. And all their views of the divine? Yep. Got them right in there. They mixed up? Yeah. Shook them up. <laughs> Got it. Why don't we see if we can arrange them hierarchically? What would it be like if we could take all the Greek gods and arrange them hierarchically, see? The highest, the next, the next, the next, the next. Would that be interesting to do? So then instead of talking about the Greek gods, we could then make distinctions among them and talk about them in different ways. What if it turned out that for each set of gods we can distinguish, there's a particular kind of logos to it? There's a certain way of reasoning appropriate for each. For each. Different. Different. Now, let me complicate this a bit, since you may be following it. Right? I think you're aware of the fact that I snuck something in earlier, right? I asked, is motion in motion? Or are things in motion? Remember that? I sneaked that one in. I said something else too, didn't I not? I said, whatever is in motion derives its motion from some source, which we call motion. Now, if you hold to this then, then there are certain ideas, like motion, which have a generative function. Right? Generative. That is to say, other things can be derived from it. Other things or ideas can be derived from it. Now, what does that mean? Okay, now that means if there is such a thing, let us say, as soul, if there is such a thing as soul, then we know the presence of soul because soul gives, as it were, life to whatever then it animates, right? Living thing. Right? We could say, say, hey, there are a lot of living things. Oh, there's something common to them all? Oh, yeah, they're all living. 
Well, if there's a bunch of red things, would we not say there must be something red that's independent of those things because each of the things is red that we've lined up? Oh, yeah. Then there must be a cause of red independent of the things that are red. And that can't be red. Right? The principle of the thing can't be one of the members, can it? Heavens, no. Well, then, it looks like, then, the principle of something is not one of the things like itself, but it derives other things from it. Now, if that's so, if that's so, if we can hold on to that notion, then we might say, then, if that's true, that there is a, such a thing as soul, and soul is what activates bodies and gives it life, because we want to attribute it to something, so we're calling it soul, but soul isn't life, it's rather the source of life. By the way, if there are a bunch of things that have souls and life, including that beautiful cat I drew a min minute ago, <laughs> right? would you agree then we have a different kinds of things that are living, but among the living things, some things seem to possess a certain quality of life that leads us to believe they have something other than life, called mind, or intelligence. Agree with that? Well then, if all of these things that are living have some degree of intelligence, and among those things that have clearly the most intelligence, we can call them the most intelligent living things. And at this point, unless whales beat us down, we're number one. And they may, but at this point, right? Well then, if there is a quality that exists in all of those things, the source of it must be independent of the particular things that have intelligence. Therefore, there must be something called intelligence, which exists in its own right, which is the source of the intelligence in things. Agree? Mm -hmm. But it itself can't be one of the things that has intelligence by the same logic that we just went through. Hey, now, if you can hold on to that, there's something curious about this. Then each one of these groups of gods we have identified could in fact be the source of a whole order of things. Other things could be derived from it. So if that's true, then not only is it possible to take a group of things called the gods and the divine and rank them hierarchically, but we may be able to say that each of those things is itself a principle, a principle that can be the cause of, and can be the cause of, and therefore can generate things akin to itself as derivatives. Well then, you see, if you hold on to that notion, you're getting close to what the Greeks mean by a god. Hey, look at us, If you can personify a quality, right, if there's a certain set of qualities that that can be said to be represented or represents a certain idea. Um, let's say, let's get one. Uh, say I want to represent the activity of insight. Uh, quick, immediate, uh, certain clarity, brings things together into a unity, what? Uh, there must therefore be a gathering together before it, a gathering together, right? It's kind of ready for action. You can use it. Um, because you get an intuition, you can then use it. You can then proceed on it. <clears throat> Now, is it possible that we can take all of those things and say, what kind of a person might exhibit all of those qualities, most ideally? A warrior? Quick, clear, unity of action? Can gather a lot of things together, ready for action? Well, we might then say among those things that might share those qualities might be someone who's a warrior, type warrior, but if, if so, 
it must come into existence quickly from, well, where does, intu where does intuition come from? Mind. Oh, ha! Well, then, if there is a divine Zeus, it must spring from his forehead, fully clad, ready for action. Athena. If we can then get all the qualities of Athena and recognize them, and then say these qualities, when we are bringing them together into a unity, can best represent the functioning of intuition, and then we can say that there is something that is divine about that, therefore we can predicate some kind of a divinity, the very nature and the source of it, well, we can create now a mythos, can't we? By personifying it, and then working back to see whether then we can put all of the personifications into a figure, and perhaps build a story around it. <clears throat> hmm. Well, if we can do that, then we can do the next thing. Now, can you please take a look at your sheet I gave you? This sheet, it has a table. Do you see that table? <clears throat> and the first row, Parmenides, that's the dialogue, Plato's dialogue. here on the board. Notice, multiple, many, whole in parts, shape, in itself, in another, at rest, motion, same, different, like, unlike, equal, time. See them all? Notice that next to each one of these is a class of gods appropriate for each of these. And the last column is where Proclus describes <clears throat> and has a commentary on each of them. Now, what does that mean? Now, look what we have here. <clears throat> hey, well, let's go back then. What do we have here? Each of these categories, when you look at them purely, what can we say? We can say, looking at them purely, maximizing what they represent, they can be considered as an archetype. They can be personified. And therefore, when you have an archetype that personifies the qualities of the thing that you're talking about, you can in fact have a figure. That figure then is going to be seen in Greek mythology. And these gods, therefore, can be ranked first, second, third, fourth, representing these logical types. Therefore, the whole function of this first hypothesis is therefore to deny these divine qualities or images of the gods of the highest concept, the one. Therefore, the one goes beyond all the gods, doesn't it? See how you came to that conclusion? Ah, now each one of these that are denied becomes the subject matter of the second hypothesis. Because here it's denied, what's it gonna be in the second? Asserted. That's right. Oh, it's going to be asserted. Ah, now look here. Okay. This gives us a problem. Let's see if we can look at a couple of problems. There's certainly a difference between working through the Diamond Sutra and the Greek tradition found in Plato and Proclus. Plato is very interested in the whole Platonic tradition in levels of reality, hierarchies. You see, the other system, the Diamond Sutra, is going to say there is, let us call it the one, <clears throat> about which you can say nothing, just for the moment use that language, but you can't say anything about anything else. Or in Hindu terms, all the rest is maya, illusion. So you only have one term. Therefore, in the Platonic tradition, they are very careful to set up levels of reality because they want to have a place for the intellect. 
They want to see how it functions. They want to understand its function. They want to understand how it operates, therefore. And they want to see, therefore, what you can say about what it can be said to be the intelligible. What you call the intelligible, by the way, are going to be these gods you lined up. Another way of talking about the divine and the gods. What does that lead us to? That leads us to see that there is a way of understanding, a very simple, fun way to understand this most complex of all systems. And what do you get then when you understand it? You can move freely within these different systems and you can enjoy them, but then you are preparing your understanding, see, you're preparing by understanding for the operation of the intellect to go beyond the intellect through the levels of reality until you can then dance around the one. Now, why does he do that? This is called the problem of the likely story. <clears throat> so, um, in the Plato's time is, he creates this cosmology. And he raises the question of whether or not that's true. He says, no, it's not, it's not a question of being true. We're giving it because we want to give a likely story. It's only a likely story. It's likely. That's likely. But by giving a likely story, you can show that the nature of reality of which we participate in is rational. And you can therefore operate on it on several levels. You can operate on the level of sense experience. You can operate it on the level of perception. You can operate on the level of understanding and intellect. Each has its proper domain. That is to say, you don't have to deny. <clears throat> you don't have to reject. You don't have to deny anything. You can include it comprehensively. Now, does that, are we being fair? Because what does this mean we're saying, without saying it, about the Diamond Sutra? Well, doesn't the Diamond Sutra have a hierarchy in it? Do, does, do, don't they make distinctions in different levels of beings, like gods, asuras, demons, heroes? What status do they have? Do you say they have some kind of status in reality? I thought that, no. but I'm not sure. Well. Do this. Look it up. When you find it, bring it back. Okay. Let me see it, and I'll change what I usually say. Right? That's all. Right. I, and I hope, and I have a copy here you can take home and go over it. I've got right? a copy. Of oh, good, 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 good. But since they're trying to grasp the very nature of enlightenment, the highest concept, right? Here, you're brought to the same kind of highest concept. They say the same thing, do they not? It's not an object of perception. You saw how one got to it, and you saw how the other got to it. Now, are we being fair? This is the problem between experience and the logos. <clears throat> That's the problem. And the Buddhist, look here. What you have to see is that there is no way in which you can experience any of these things that you think are so real and important to you. You have to see that there is no soul, there is no self, there is no person, there is no being. There is, in fact, an emptiness of those very concepts. And all they are is empty concepts. That then, by staying with that, meditating on that, there is an experience. But what is the experience? The experience is not of something new. What you're doing is not perceiving things through those ideas or beliefs. So all you're doing is clearing these ideas from your mind. And what is left is just what is emptiness. Of what? Of those very ideas. In the Platonic realm, here we go, they want the logos. They want to find the intelligibility. They want to be embracive. They want to include it all and hierarchically reach there. There are two different ways of reaching the same thing, I submit to you. Right. And therefore, I'll give you how they perceive their highest vision, <clears throat> the Buddhists, all right, since this is 
how the platonic does. So here's a right. <laughs> yeah. I once did a paper years ago on Shunyata for Alan Watts, of which he enjoyed. I gave him a blank piece of paper, and he looked at it and he said, who should I grade? I got it back. <clears throat> And I ruffled it up and I gave it back to him. He said, okay. <laughs> so that's the trip I wanted to take you on tonight. I know we compacted a few things together, did I not? So anything you want to uh, explore at this point, please do so. Can I see that book? Yes. And the other book is, of course, this one called Proclus's Commentary on Plato's Parmenides. Uh, this is the Parmenides, the Love Edition. <clears throat> yes? You have to do it. I have to take you back to the dialectic and ask you about the fairness in taking something and testing it with the dialectic without, without being appropriate with the thing that you're comparing it to. Don't you have to... I mean, you said before that you can do the dialectic on anything and any idea. Is that, can you demonstrate that? that I mean, because it, I thought they, I thought there had to be an appropriate pair. I thought they. No, no. The pair is just that it is and that it is not. Uh huh. But not with respect to any particular? The, the other doesn't have to be a particular, uh, in a particular relationship with a thing that you're that you're wanting to explore, like you can't take soul and do a dialectic on, on soul without pairing it up with its appropriate other. Is that not true, or can you? Right, you can say if soul, and you're going to take it through the twenty-four categories. Right. Right. You can also say if there is no soul. Now, watch now. Is that different than uh, if soul does not exist? Because um, you're involved with double negatives. Um, if there is no such thing as a soul, there might be mind. Might be a person. Might be a being. Now, the part, just to now go back to your point, okay? This is the pair then. If soul exists, if soul does not. Okay, but what are you going to relate it to? Pardon me? What are you going to relate it to as the other when you do the, when you do the, with respect to the other? In respect to four categories, in relation to itself. Oh! What are you going oh, to it to? Oh, you want to say, oh, sure, sure. Uh, how it is in itself, right? How it is to other things, right? Does it, right? Does it matter uh, what the How these other things, how these other things relate to themselves? Right, but in order How those to, things relate back to the idea of the soul? In order to talk about those other things, though, you have to have named them and know how they function. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to describe how they Absolutely. affect themselves and how they affect the soul. So you have to name it. You can't just say, if soul exists, how is it in relationship to what? A tree, rock, bush, man, 
Uh, doesn't it have to be in relationship to its appropriate other? If there is a soul, then it must be self-autonomous. It must have a self-sufficiency. It must be autonomous. Would you agree? Yeah. Fine. And that's something I can say about it that is true, is it not? True. Right. Uh, would you not agree I can also talk about things about the nature of the soul just by itself? Uh, that is false, as you can. That is, you cannot say that, that it occupies lifeless bodies. Right. Right. You can say the soul both is a living thing and an intelligible thing. It's both, both is and is not. Right. Right. I can go on and make other statements, can I not? Right. Where's the other? I think you're thinking, of, should, should, should there not be other kinds of things? No, is that correct? Wait, is that your point? Isn't one of the categories to say how the things affect, let's see, no, I guess it, it's only with respect to the soul. No, just in respect to the soul. Hmm, see, I have a, I have a hard time knowing what the qualities of the soul, that's interesting, you have to know the qualities of the thing before you can do the dialectic, it seems. Oh, sure. You have to know a lot of stuff. You have to know all the categories. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's true. Um, let's see if I can uh, play. There's a great one in here I like very much um, that he uses. Um, Normally, I just open the book up and it falls right there. Um. Yeah, hey, by God, sure it is. Um. Matter of fact, I'm here on page uh, 354. Okay, watch. Again, if soul exists, now I'm taking it in respect to other things. Right? That it is productive of life, that initiates motion, that it holds together bodies as long as it is present to bodies, that it lords and rules over them by nature. Right? That's what it does to other, th that's how it functions in respect to other things, doesn't it? It is productive of life. That's what it does. It produce, It has an effect on other things. Right? It is productive of life. Uh, it initiates motion in all these other things, does it not? It holds t t together bodies, does it not? That's what it does to various parts. Um, in relationship to themselves. Now, all they're going to be is qualities. There's a sympathetic affection. Right. Well, other things, it's sympathetic affection, right? Um, now, going back, if the soul exists, then it's true for bodies in relation to being moved from within by it, being vivified by it, living, being preserved and held together through it and in general being dependent upon it, right? Exactly. Going back, yeah. Then it's dependent upon soul and it's dependent, right? So yes, you do have to have all of these, these categories in your mind to know how they fit together, and that's how you play. You have to know how the soul functions before you can talk about it in, you, with respect to the other things. The way to get into Proclus and, and these subjects, therefore, is to know about the major ideas, soul, intellect, likeness, motion, rest. So you can see, so it's the same thing we're doing before. If these, so if any one of these ideas has a set of ideas around it that, are, that must be understood with it as part of it, then you can arrange them logically, can't you? Right. Some of these things you could therefore say, right, looking at them, 
You can also say things about those things that are true, those things that are false. You can collect other things that are both true and false. And we're then not talking about things other than soul. We're talking about the way in which it functions. Oh, let me give you some negatives. Which one? Which one of the four do you want? In respect to itself, in respect to others, and the way others relate to it, or the way in which all of those things relate back to it, negatively. Respect to others and okay, respect to others. Okay. Um, well, that'd be 16, 17, 18, right. If the soul does not exist, they are true of it in relation to bodies, being incapable of generating them, being unmingled with them, and having no care of them. If there is no soul, right, if there is no soul, then among, right, then therefore we cannot say that there'll be any relationship to bodies, they'll be incapable of generating anything, right, and being unmingled with other things, there will be no care for them since the soul takes care of the body. Right? Okay, good, good, good. Pardon? I was wondering if that was the, the category asked for, how the soul relates to other things if it doesn't exist. That's right, that's what it was asked for. Yeah, yeah. Could you do one where you can speak about other things independent of what you hypothesized? No, you can't do that. No, Isn't that what you said earlier, that the third one is speaking about the other things independent of the hypothesis? The mm -hmm. original subject? Not, the, not in that language. Want to say it again? Maybe I didn't get it. Um, you mean the first hypothesis? The things that are denied in the first hypothesis become what is asserted in the second hypothesis. Okay. That's true. Go ahead. I mean in the, in the 24 votes? Yes. In the four different ways yes. that you can speak uh -huh. the third one, yeah. mm -hmm. where you speak about other things independent of the original idea? Well, oh, it's independent yeah. of the way, it's independent of its source, it's right, okay. We're talking about, uh, then we're talking about the effect here, assuming that we're talking about soul for a moment, right? Then we want to know what kind of language we can use when we're just talking about whatever these things are among themselves. Yeah. That's the one that's hard to do. If there is such a thing as a soul, then the thing that would become obvious would there there would, there would have to be a sympathetic union of these things. Yeah. Oh, so that would be a statement right there. That's the statement he would make, mm -hmm. which is what he said. I, I can. Uh, yeah. Okay. The second is it follows right. If the soul exists, the following is true for the rest of things in the case of bodies. You see, uh, I should make that clear. Um, you see, when we're talking about soul, right, we can talk about it in relationship to bodies. You can also talk about it in relationship to intelligence or, or intellect. And then you'd have a different set of ideas as it relates to this. For this has a set of qualities which you'd have to become aware of. And then it's in reference to these ideas that you would make in your distinctions respect to itself and respect to others and respect to the things themselves and back to the source of that. Okay, so you can't lump them all together and talk about the other. You talk about what the soul affects. You can't, you can, I suppose, lump them all together, but the Statements would be different, wouldn't they? I hope so. Yeah. If we're together. Separated it out. And yeah. Just talked so, about intellect. so see, here it's soul in respect to bodies, and therefore there would be a sympathetic union among those things. That's what you could say that is true. What you could say about it that would be false is that it's not. What you can say about it is that it is not true that it lacks sensations. For it's necessary that with the presence of soul, everything should have sensation. What is true and false about it is that bodies move themselves. In a way, body moves themselves because they're ensouled. In another way, they do not. So 
that something you can say that's true about it? Not true about it. Yeah. So therefore, would you agree to play this game, you would have to know what they think about these major ideas and then see how they can be attributed to these, this ranking of four major concepts or categories about which you can then say three things, true, false, and both true and false. Um, now, uh, uh, one of the great ones that he does, see one of the principal ideas in the Platonic world is likeness. Because the whole gener see the whole universe is created out, of, created out of likeness because the demiurge, the God, the creator, he creates it and the condition for creation is likeness because he reflects on himself and uses himself as a model and therefore creates the universe in respect to the model that he has. Therefore, all creation is premised on the condition that there is likeness. Of course, be able to say that I'm making something like the, well, that, in order to say I'm making something like something, the condition for likeness sure must be there. Therefore, the supreme principle, uh, the supreme originating principle of the universe is likeness. Okay, now there should be a set of ideas that surround the idea of likeness. If you have identified all of those, then you can then arrange them in these 24 categories, both positive and negative, and that's the dialectic treatment of likeness, or soul, or whatever. And we'll do it one night if you want, but I don't think we'll have time to pull it off. With. Don't you think this is an experience, though, too? If you go through the dialectic and you see all these relationships, can't that be counted as an experience and the logos, both? Yes or no. Uh, you are certainly going through something, but it's not a specific experience like you might experience through sight, through hearing. What you're doing, see what this does, essentially what this does for the person who wants to play the game, is to see that ideas belong in families, natural families. There's a kin kinship among ideas and that there's a way in which you can unite with them and the way in which you can then understand their hierarchical significance. You can see the way in which certain sets of ideas naturally fit. See, because take this one as an example. We have soul in respect to body, which we did. There'd be another set in respect to intelligence. Uh, if we then use the idea of likeness, now there's a set of ideas which we would have to identify first and then see how they could be set into those categories. Agree? Now, if you realize that the, most, the supreme originating idea of the generation of the cosmos is the idea of likeness, wouldn't it be interesting to get a deeper understanding of the idea of likeness? Would you not then come to that idea with a greater richness? And that's what the dialectic brings you, see, the great original. And that's uh, pretty good. That was a joke, by the way. I hope someone got it. That's pretty good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Like, with likeness, the, see, with likeness, you'd have to have the primary idea would have to be, well, it's a primary idea. Right? It's a productive idea, isn't it? It's the very condition for everything, therefore it's a primary idea, it's a productive idea. Right? And what does it do? It's a bond. See, we, we can build it together, but it'll take a while to argue. The, the most difficult category for me is being able to uh, keep in mind all the true and false ones. That's a, that gets a little thorny at times. And the negatives are not the denial, are not merely the denial of the positive. Likeness, okay? Um, that I know where it is, 358. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No? Yes. Yeah, okay. Likeness, in relationship to itself, productiveness, primacy, 
eternity. In relation to sense objects, assimilation to them, to intellectual objects, not allowing them to dissolve into a sea of unlikeness, linking of parts to their respective wholes. For sense objects, relationship to themselves, a community with one another, participation in one another, taking pleasure in one another, taking pleasure in and sympathizing with and mingling with what's like. That's the basis of uh, communication and love, isn't it? Likeness. Um, in relationship to it, one participates in it, there's an assimilation to it, there's a unification by virtue of it. That's, it's real fine stuff. Yeah, I recommend. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, I had a question. Um, and I think this was brought up before, but I still don't really get it. Uh, when we're talking about the dialectic and it's, uh, you're comparing the subject to other things, and do we just lump other things together to actually no. comparing it to specific things? No. It's the, it's the essential ideas that are connected with it. Okay. Okay. All right. Let, let me see if I can give you an example, because he's got a couple of good ones. Um, let's take soul. Um, and show you how he does it. If soul exists in relationship to itself, essential life, it's self-constituted, self-motion. Now, those ideas are, would you not agree, are what you'd say must be there if you know what you mean by the word soul. So the necess these are a set of necessary ideas that best explain what it is and how it functions. It functions to itself in respect to others, among themselves, and back to it. Um, Could you repeat that line? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So then, if soul exists, there is truth of it in relationship to itself, self-constituted, self-motion, essential life. So let me take the fourth one then, which is in respect to other things. There is a truth of it in relation to bodies, that it is productive of life, that it initiates motion among them, that it holds together bodies as long as it is present to bodies. See? Among themselves, Sympathetic affection, as we mentioned, right? right? Going back, going back. Right. So, this is a very fine book. I recommend it. Right. Thank you for coming. Enjoyed it.